Richard, did you want to, did you have something? I lost him. But his hand was up. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to move right into Chair's remarks. Uh, on September 27th, Samantha and I attended the virtual Conservation Ontario Council meeting where the phase one Conservation Act changes continues to be a key agenda item and topic discussion as well as other matters. And, uh, you know, Conservation Ontario has been working with us and Sam's been working with the province on these regulations and we've had some successes. She's going to get into more detail later. So in a mixed bag, there, there are some, there is some good news in there. On October 4th, uh, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks released phase one regulations to implement amendments to the Conservation Act made in 2019, 2020. Samantha has a report later in this agenda and uh, a meeting of the CA ad hoc committee has been scheduled for October 22nd to further discuss these regulatory changes and timelines. And uh, GRSA staff are beginning to receive requests from member municipalities to present the 2022 budget. So um, if there are any municipalities who would like to get a presentation from our staff on the budget going forward, please let us know, send Samantha or Karen a note and uh, we'll be happy to um, show up and uh, tell you what we're about. Cause you know, we're getting into budget times and I think people wanna know what these numbers are gonna be. So that's anybody who wants that presentation, please let us know. So that said, I have a motion that the, um, the review of the agenda, I have a motion that the agenda for the general membership meeting be approved as circulated. And I get a move moved by Kathy, seconded by Jerry. Any opposed? That is Carrie, thank you. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing and hearing none, minutes of the previous minutes, uh, minutes of the previous meetings, that the minutes of the general membership meeting of September 24th, 2021 be approved as circulated, moved by Brian, seconded by Sue. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. No business arising. No. Well, we're right down to reports. So 12.1, Conservation Authorities Amendment Act. Sam's got a presentation for it. So I'll just turn it over to you, Samantha. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as the chair alluded to in his comments, the new regulations for phase one were released um, on October 4th, the week of October 4th. And um, this presentation is more just to highlight the board to let them know in terms of some of the timelines that were amended as well as some of the deliverables. Um, and just to at a high level sort of introduce um, the new regulations and the requirements because uh, we do have some things that we have to get done before the end of the year. So you'll recall from previous presentations and probably as well when the consultation guide was released to the public, um, there were a number of regulations. There are actually four regulations that were covered um, in that consultation guide. Um, the province, uh, through the consultation process, did decide to not move forward with the um, community advisory board regulation. So you'll notice that there's actually only three regulations that were released with the phase one regulations. The province um, on their decision that was posted on the ERO mentioned that they received a number of comments related to the community advisory board and that, um, sorry, it's coming down, that's okay. <laughs> and that, um, uh, they felt that a number of CAs already had various boards that uh, seemed to be working. And they also said too that it would, they would leave it at the discretion of the boards to determine whether or not they wanted to um, create any additional or to create a new community advisory board. So that was a really good thing because I think we all recognize the administrative burden that um, could come along with having to have another board or another, manage another board. So the three regulations that were released were the mandatory programs and services regulation, um, the transition plan and agreements regulation, and then the rules of conduct and conservation areas regulation, which is really the section 29 regulation that we have. I think one of the other um, significant uh, changes that was made is that um, we don't have to come into conformance 
with the new funding framework until January 1st, 2024. So that means that it will have the same approach um, that we've been using in the 2022 budget for the 2023 budget, and it'll be the new framework that has to be implemented for the 2024 budget. So just again, at a high level, one of the um, main things in terms of the mandatory programs and services is the three different categories um, of programs and services that we now have to migrate towards in terms of the funding and the frameworks for all of the programs and services that the DRCA offers. So category one are called the mandatory programs and services. So those are regulated through this regulation, the first regulation, and can be supported through levy funding. The second category are the municipal requested programs and services. These are the ones where we have to get the MOUs with the participating or other watershed municipalities to deliver the programs. We can use levy dollars provided we have that MOU agreement, but keeping in mind, we can also have government grants and GRC revenue that can go towards supporting those programs. Finally, the category three programs are the ones that um, the GRCA board determines are important to the watershed or they're the locally requested um, or offered programs. And again, you can get into MOUs with municipalities if they decide they want to use levy um, to support that. But generally speaking, these are the programs and services that are supported by GRCA revenue. So um, our parks, for example, um, or there's some kind of special agreement um, between other agencies and ourselves in terms of delivering those programs and services. So again, just at a high level, the category one programs and services include uh, regulations on the natural hazards program, the conservation lands. One of the important things that came out of the regulation that wasn't included in the consultation, but the province received a number of comments and concerns was the need to include passive recreation in the mandatory programs. So at the GRCA, passive recreation are all those properties that we have where you don't pay to access. Um, they're just a trail system. So some examples could be Damascus or Schneider's Flats. Also in the mandatory programs and services is source water protection. There were two other components. So the Lake Simcoe Act and um, mandatory program in terms of the Ontario building code, which is really the, some of the northern CAs. So the two in green don't apply to the GRCA. And then finally, there were prescribed regulations regarding the core watershed-based resource management strategy and then the provincial water quality and quantity monitoring programs. So within the mandatory regulations, so the programs and services, there were six mandatory deliverables, which are due at the end of 2024. So again, we go into our new framework in January 1st, 2024. So our 2024 budget will be in the new framework. These deliverables aren't required until the end of 2024. So we're going to be required to create natural hazard infrastructure operational management plans. There is also a requirement for that natural hazard infrastructure to create asset management plans. We have to create a water-based resource management strategy. I think one of the benefits to the water management plan that the GRC has already gone through the process for is that creates a really great foundation um, for the development of this strategy. We also have to have a conservation area strategy. So that's a high level strategy about how we manage our properties, as well as a land inventory. And then finally, we also have to have an ice management plan. So just at a high level, um, in the transition plan and agreements regulation is really the process that we have to follow to come into conformance with the new regulations that have to be in at the uh, beginning of 2024. So the first deliverable that's required at the end of this year is a transition plan. So that needs to be approved by the board. It needs to be posted to our website as well as um, circulated to the municipalities. So this transition plan just identifies the steps that we're going to take to come into conformance with the regulation and to acquire all of those MOUs that would be required to support all of the category two uh, programs and services. At the end of February, which is when we are required to submit our first quarterly report on, um, I guess, how far we've gotten along in the transition plan, 
And we do have to um, submit an inventory of programs and services. So those are the current programs and services that the GRCA currently provides, and then breaking them down into the three categories. So where do they fit in terms of category one, mandatory programs and services, category two, the municipal um, requested programs, and then the other programs and services. Within the regulation, we are required to provide quarterly reports to the province and again, post those onto the um, GRCA website. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to recognize in the regulation is that the province does acknowledge that this is a dynamic process and that there will be changes made throughout um, the two-year process or the transition period um, to come into conformance. So in those quarterly reports, we're required to update on our progress, but if there's any changes or challenges that we've identified um, throughout the process that we've gone through, we need to identify that as well, as well as any changes. So if the inventory changes or there's different elements of the transition plan that change, then we have to provide it in those updates as well. In the regulation, they do provide a provision for extensions to the transition period timeline. They just request that you would submit any of those requests for the extension before the October 1st, 2023. So about 60, 90 days before um, the deadline for the January 1st, 2024. And then finally, we have to come into um, conformance at the beginning of 2024. And then at the end of that month, we have to submit a final report to MECP with the final inventory um, programs and services as well, as well as copies of all of the MOUs that are in place um, for this new framework funding framework. So the, the last regulation that was released was the basically the section 29. So what happened there was each um, conservation authority had their own regulation. The minister consolidated it into one regulation. Um, there were some minor word tweaking to it, but there's nothing significant in terms of changing and it won't affect any of our business at this point in time, it'll be business as usual. The other side of this is this regulation won't come into effect really until the section 28 regulation comes out under the changes that the government made to the act, um, the enforcement um, component or the enforcement section of the act is going to consolidate section 28 and section 29. So that will um, that'll be section 30. So it won't actually come into effect until the section 28 regulations have been released and finalized. So right now um, they're out and again, there weren't any significant changes. So in terms of next steps, we've got a lot of work <laughs> to get done. So we have to develop the transition plan and that programs and service inventory, um, consult with municipalities, negotiate, um, those agreements with our partnering municipalities and any other watershed municipalities um, that provide funding for some of the programs and services we provide. Um, and then ultimately, we'll have a new format for our budget in 2024. They, there are still the phase two regulations. So those were the levy regulations and the fee policy and the provincial working group is working with the province on getting the um, consultation guide out as soon as possible. Um, the province does recognize that the levy and the fee policy regulations will have an impact as well on the inventory for the programs and services. So there is a sense of urgency for the province to get those regulations out. So once they are posted, again, we'll bring back comments to the board and comment on the EBR posting that will um, provide the forum for the consultation on that. In terms of the Section 28, so that's our development regulation. Um, MNRF is still in the process of reviewing that, and we're not sure when that's coming out. There hasn't been a date yet for when the consultation will happen with the uh, new regulation. And with that, Mr. Chair, um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. All right. Thank you, Sam. That's a very good outline of what's going on here. It looks like we're starting to get a little bit of clarity about what's going on. So uh, comments or questions from the board? Uh, Bruce Whale. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple questions, Samantha. 
there is no mention in there of land use planning or the CA's role in land use planning or protecting sensitive areas, wetlands, shorelines. Um, I wonder, is that something they're avoiding intentionally or do you think that will fall in under the water protection and core watershed resource management strategies? And also other ones that concern me, climate change and tree planting, is there, there's no mention of, of uh, work that we do to, to uh, help with climate change or control climate change. And then the other one is the rural water quality programs that are sponsored by several of the counties now and uh, the GRCA administer those programs. Would they be under uh, programs that you make arrangements with each of those municipalities or are they considered core programs as well? Um, three you, Mr. Chair. So I'm gonna try and answer all three of them, but if I forget or don't answer it, just let me know, Bruce. Um, so in terms of the way that the regulations are set up, the mandatory programs and services highlight the programs and services that the authority can levy municipalities for. So if you go into the actual regulations, you'll see that it speaks to um, natural hazards. So that's uh, the flood control, flood management. Um, you'll see too that it goes into talk about conservation land and sort of the responsibilities that they feel are mandatory for us to manage our properties. I think it, it does go in the natural hazard regulation. It does speak to our uh, conservation authority's role in the planning process in terms of the natural hazards. So you're right, Bruce, in that it's just sort of really a third of what the authority does. Any other additional programs and services that don't fall into those mandatory or the category one bucket are what the authority has to negotiate with the other, with other municipalities, whether it be the partnering municipalities or other watershed municipalities to deliver those programs and services. So currently right now, um, we do have MOUs with most of the municipalities regarding planning and plan review. Um, those agreements at, right now don't necessarily speak to funding because a lot of the um, funding for planning comes in through uh, uh, planning fees and permit fees to support that, but also a portion of it is supported by the levy. So it's going to be a, a tricky thing. So again, I'm just gonna talk about the Real Water Quality Program. You don't see that in the mandatory programs and services because it'll fall into the category two programs and services where it'll have to be a MOU that's negotiated with water, the watershed municipalities um, in terms of the parameters of that program. So again, if they don't necessarily fit in the mandatory, it doesn't mean that we can't offer them. It just means that we have to either negotiate with the municipalities to figure out the scope and scale of that, that program or it falls into the other category, which is the category of three um, programs and services that are determined by the board. But certainly I think, you know, we've seen from our, all of our municipalities, the value in terms of the comments that staff have on the natural heritage side in the planning process. Um, so I would anticipate that when we're negotiating that component that the municipalities will still be favorable of supporting that function that the GRCA provides. Okay, uh, Bruce Scott, did you have a Could I follow up just for a second, Mr. Chair? Sure. The, the one you didn't mention, uh, Samantha, was the our tree planting and our tree nurseries. Are they going to be a, a mandatory or will they be a, a one that we have to go to municipalities for levy support? So this is part of the process for the transition plan is that we have to go through all of the programs and services that we currently provide and fit them into the three categories. So in terms of tree planting, it looks like under the mandatory programs and services, any restoration work we do on our property, so GRCA owned property, is a mandatory program. But private tree planting or private or planting on private lands would probably fall into the category two. 
The challenge that I think we're going to have is when we start to break things out, we may have programs and services where a portion of them fall in the mandatory, a portion of them fall in the category two, so the municipal requested, and then a portion of them fall into the category three, which is the board driven programs and services. So it's going to be that's, I think, the biggest challenge we have is not necessarily creating the transition plan, which will outline how we get to it. It's going to be figuring out how this new framework works for all the programs and services that we have within the GRCA. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Mr. Catherine. And thank you through you, um, Mr. Chair. Bruce asked a couple of my questions. As a, uh, as a municipal leader, I can't speak for all of my council at the time, but I do know that with our strategic plan in the city of Cambridge, it has been recently updated. There's a huge focus of our community on ensuring that we are living sustainably and that our environment is protected. And of course, the GRC lands and programs that are offered uh, within and around the city of Cambridge, I know are very important to our residents. I'm, I'm looking forward to some broader discussion about the levies and the different programs as we march through this process. I'm just wondering, this is more of an operational question, but have you put your mind yet to how you're going to intersect with the municipalities? Um, I know that my council would certainly want a much more robust uh, presentation such as the one that you just gave in order to understand the process and the changes in our responsibilities and um, and sort of um, beloved programs uh, for our municipality. So we're looking for how are we going to communicate with all of our municipalities, knowing of course that this is a, a huge amount of work in the in the near future. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, yeah, I think part of the transition plan will identify the sort of check-in points. I think um, in terms of the way that the regulation is set up, it identifies that the MOUs have to be with the participating municipalities, so the levy paying municipalities. Um, one of the things that they did change, though, in terms of the consultation guide was recognize that um, within the GRCA, we have 22 levy paying municipalities, but we also provide other programs and services to watershed municipalities. So there are some municipalities where we provide programs and services to um, that aren't necessarily the participating, but they contribute funding to, for example, the rural water quality program. Um, we have some municipalities that aren't participating that provide funding for that. Um, I think given we already have some meetings set up with senior staff at some of the municipalities. Um, I have been meeting with uh, some of the municipalities, the staff to sort of inform them of the changes that are coming and the tight timelines because there's also the municipal component. So these MOUs that we negotiate with the municipalities have to be endorsed by council. So for them to be approved. Um, so there's going to be a lot of back and forth in terms of discussions with the municipalities. And certainly one of the items we put in the transition plan is that if there's a request for us to come to council to talk about the new programs and services or to go over the inventory of programs and services that we're very happy to do that. Okay, thanks, Samantha. Um, are there any other comments or questions from the board? Seeing none, uh, again, work in progress. And again, wanna thank Sam. She's working day and night on this stuff and has been very integral to the process. And the fact that I believe some of uh, the input that we've had and so forth through Sam has influenced some of the, like honestly, those advisory committees. There are some small boards who may get some use out of them because they have a tiny budget. But to make those mandatory was just nuts. So uh, getting rid of some of that stuff has been very positive. So anyway, that said, I have a motion that report number GM 102175, Conservation Authorities Act Amendments, Phase 1 Regulations and Timelines, be received as information. Moved by John, seconded by Joe. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Moving on to board meeting schedule. I don't know if you want to. So there it is. It's fairly standard, pretty much what we're, we're already doing. 
Um, are there any comments or questions on it? Can I get a mover for that? Uh, oh, sorry, let me read it. Motion that the meeting schedule for 2022 Grand River Conservation Authority general membership meetings be approved. Moved by Sue, seconded by Warren. Any opposed? That is carried. We can begin to fill out your 2022 calendar there. Um, cash and investment status. I have a motion that report number GM 102171 cash and investment status, September 2021 be received as information. Uh, are there any questions or comments? I'll ask that for, okay. Move by John, seconded by Richard. Any opposed? Carried. Financial summary. Motion that the financial summary for the period ending September 30, 2021 be approved. Are there any comments or questions? Bob? Yes, I think I'm on the right report here. Uh, this is uh, 1073. Yes, sir. 12.4. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, the Guelph City Link Trail, if I could have a little bit of an explanation about what's going on there through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um. Through you, Mr. Chair, so in terms of the status of the trail, we have hired um, consultants to help with the trail design. So we did finish the topography um, survey as well as some of the preliminary discussions with the city of Guelph in terms of requirements for the trail and also internally with staff. So it's moving forward. Um, we're hoping that probably by the December, um, we'll have at least the drawings ready for tender. Um, I think it's a question of whether or not we tender in December or wait to the spring. Thank you. Oh. Any, any further comments or questions on the financial summary? Can I get a mover, please? Moved by Bob, seconded by Jim. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Park Reservation System, I'm going to just read the motion that staff be authorized to negotiate agreement with K. Hamas Incorporated to provide a conservation area reservation system for a term of three years with the option to extend the contract for up to three additional one-year terms. Any comments or questions? Jane? Yeah, I just wanted to, I just wondered what was the uh, firm we had a number of years ago? What was the name of them where things didn't go well? For you, Mr. Chair, it's, it is Camus. That is why it sounds familiar to you. Yeah. Um, so that, that was thoroughly discussed through the, the process um, and all of our concerns were addressed. And uh, I would say that, that their organizational approach has changed significantly since we encountered those difficulties. You have a great memory. <laughs> got everything all fixed up. That's good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I thought that when I saw that, I was just like, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. See, that? there's the value of corporate memory, right? Yeah. Okay. Any other uh, comments or questions? Uh, Kate, can I get a mover, please? Moved by Guy, seconded by John. Any opposed? That is carried. Thank you. Development interference with wetlands and alteration shorelines. I have a motion that report number GM 102169, development interference with wetlands and alterations to shorelines and water courses regulations be received as information. Any comments or questions on that? Richard? No, I'm just moving it. Oh, okay, moved by. Are there any comments or questions? Okay, moved by Richard, second by Jerry. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. We are up to the September 23, 20, 2020, September 22nd to 23rd flood event. I believe Dwight has a presentation for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be turned to uh, bring up the presentation and uh, start the slideshow. Hi. Um, next slide, please. 
So we had, had a large scale rainfall event that moved into the watershed uh, September 21st and 22nd. Um, the characteristics of this event were, first of all, it was widespread. It was a longer duration event that occurred over 24 hours. Um, and the last four hours of the storm, uh, we got about a third of, of the rainfall uh, from the event. Some areas got 120 millimeters. Um, the last storm of this sort of widespread uh, nature and magnitude uh, likely occurred in September 1986. Um, we get them from time to time, particularly if there's remnants from hurricanes. Um, but this was a, a larger volume event um, that really affected the northwest part of the watershed, uh, the central west part of the watershed west of Kitchener and, and Waterloo, um, and some of the heaviest rainfall occurred in, in the headwaters of the Ness River watershed. Next slide, please. The storm um, received enhancement from um, the southeastern United States. They called it a conveyor belt system that set up. Um, and the image that you see to the right, although it's maybe hard to make out uh, just the, uh, the political boundaries, extended from um, the Atlantic Ocean just off the, the southeastern United States all the way into southern Ontario. And there was a low pressure system to the left that was in the Windsor area. And those two systems combined, but the system from the southeastern United States was just conveying moisture from the Atlantic. And that's really what enhanced the, the, uh, the end of the storm and caused uh, about 30 to 40 millimeters of rainfall in about a four hour period. Um, we seem to be seeing more of these sort of events. And I think the weather forecasters sometimes have a challenge um, when these sort of events pick up. But obviously, uh, you know, we can receive moisture from several thousand kilometers away um, and then can enhance the systems moving across the Great Lakes. We've seen that in, in June 2017. Next slide, please. So this graph shows how the rainfall accumulated uh, during the event. Um, the rain started the evening of Tuesday, September 22nd. Um, by the morning of uh, Wednesday, September 23rd, we had about a half inch in uh, some of the higher impacted areas of the watershed. Um, it continued to rain and then around about noon that day, it tapered off and it looked like uh, uh, I take it the storm was starting to wane. Um, and then between about 4 and 8 p.m. that night, a second burst of rainfall came in. And that's where you see the jump in the graph um, and added another 30 to 40 millimeters of rainfall. The earlier rain up till noon on September 23rd or 22nd um, saturated the soil. It's been dry over the summer, but uh, that initial rainfall really saturated the soil. And then uh, when we had the second burst of rainfall, of course, very little of it went in the ground and it came off very quickly. Next slide, please. So it caused some uh, rapid response on the upper Conestoga watershed above Drayton, uh, the Nith River. Uh, impacted uh, community of Wellesley, New Hamburg, and Air. And there was also um, heavy inflows into Laurel Creek Reservoir. And there was some urban flooding on Snyder's Creek. Those were the main impacted areas. Um, it got into the zone one flood uh, areas in New Hamburg and Air. Um, and the other thing or characteristic of this event uh, when we get fall events on the Nith River, when there's uh, a lot of vegetation on the fields and in the floodplain, it tends to delay the flood peak. Um, so the variation in time of travel of the flood peak in the uh, spring versus fall on the Nith can vary as much as 12 hours. 
Um, in the spring, you can have about a 12 hour travel time between the peak in New Hamburg and Air. But when you get into the fall, because of that vegetation on the floodplain and whether or not the crops have been taken off the fields or not, um, that can cause that peak to take 24 hours to travel through the system. So that's something we did experience during uh, the most recent event. Next slide, please. Some pictures of flooding in New Hamburg um, at the New Hamburg uh, fairgrounds, which typically flood in that zone one area and traditionally do flood on a fairly frequent basis. Uh, some pictures of the dam. The other challenge we get uh, during these type of events is we have public safety devices above the dams. Sometimes logs uh, will move those out. You can see our one boy is downstream of New Hamburg Dam. And we typically then dispatch staff to put those public safety devices back in place. Next slide, please. We did have a high level event at Wellesley Dam. Um, originally, uh, the afternoon of Wednesday 22nd, uh, September 22nd, staff were dispatched um, and towards the end of the day opened up the gate at Wellesley Dam. Um, then we received another uh, 40 millimeters of rainfall between 4 and 8 p.m. Staff were uh, again dispatched later that evening uh, to further open the gate and stayed with the dam until we stabilized levels. Uh, we didn't overtop the emergency spillway, but certainly the, the response to Wellesley Dam was very rapid because of uh, that shot of rainfall between 4 and 8 p.m. We have a monitoring system with alarming on it, so it helps us detect unexpected events. So our, we call it our voice alert system. So it monitors our rain gauges, our stream gauges, and our dams. And when uh, unexpected uh, events occur, then it triggers alarms to to our senior operators who then uh, initiate action. We completed an inspection of the dam after and we've changed some of the operating procedures uh, and thresholds at Wellesley Dam. And we're looking for options, uh, whether it be local assistance for assistance in operating a dam or implementing some autom automated gate operations um, similar to what we have at New Dundee Dam. Next slide, please. With all events, um, we do a, an internal debrief and we also will discuss with uh, some of the flood coordinators and affected municipalities. Um, so we've completed those debriefs. We learn from every flood and it's important to, um, you know, step back and look at the, the facts associated with the flood. Uh, look at what went well, what could be improved on with the view of constantly improving the system and sharing the experience with the range of staff. So over a time, you create a good uh, succession or learning for other staff that are involved with the program. The other thing I just wanted to draw attention to is our flood warning guide. We publish it twice a year. Um, we've got another flood coordinators meeting coming up uh, December 2nd, and we'll uh, issue an updated guide heading into the, the winter season when we can get uh, flood event activity. But the guide is very important in that it lists all the emergency management folks that are involved in the flood warning system, either with forecasting or response. It's got GRCA contacts, municipal contacts, police, and emergency management. Um, so our phone numbers are in there. And uh, certainly if you're looking for contact information in an emergency, um, you know, I direct you to that guide. We, we put a lot of time into making sure it's up to date um, and uh, certainly it's a, a useful uh, resource when we get into emergencies. And it's important, uh, if something's important, please pick up the phone and call. Um, that's the most direct way of, of communicating with us in, in an event. Um, next slide, I'll take any questions uh, the board uh, may have about the report or, or the presentation. Okay, thanks Dwight. Um, uh, comments or questions from the board? Jane? Yes, um, that was quite the event. And the question I have is uh, in Waterloo at Laurel Creek, 
there was uh, Laurel Creek became, I think, the fullest I'd ever seen, and it lifted some tiles or lifted part of uh, the Waterloo Town Square. And uh, people, constituents were kind of wondering to me, was that a problem with the culvert? And I said, no, it was just an unusual type thing. So if you could comment on that, that would be great. That, that through you, uh, Mr. Chair, that's the first I'd heard uh, there was any damage in Waterloo, uh, uh, Jane. So what I will do is, is follow up with that. But certainly it was uh, an uncommon event, that volume of rainfall. Um, you know, as I said, likely that widespread of rainfall um, is an event we likely haven't seen since about 1986. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, was very unusual, but uh, I, I felt justified at when I was chair Sometimes people came to me and asked if they could build on the city hall parking lot. Why can't we do that? Why can't we build on the parking lot by the square? And I now feel totally justified in saying, no, staff says it's the floodplain. So thanks for that. Water does need space. Yeah, that's for sure. Thanks, Jane. Richard? Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're doing a great job, by the way. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I um, boy, I, I just love these reports. As you know, I've commented on them quite often. Uh, this really highlights uh, the work that the GRCA does, what our reservoirs and our dams, and how important it is that we do. N nothing highlights it like this. I'm just wondering when these events happen, is there an ability for us to uh, uh, do a little bit of our own marketing, where we uh, we reassure the public that you know we have a, a extreme weather event happening. Uh, the GRCA has, uh, we have no issues with the with, with flooding or whatever it might be, however we want to phrase it, uh, that we, be, with our reservoirs and dams in place, they're all working at, at, at uh, full full capacity or whatever it might be. Uh, and uh, to assure the public, it's an opportunity to market and ensure the public that the GRC, the reason you're not having flooding in your neighborhood is because we're here. Just, I just think that might be an opportunity as a thought. Through you, Mr. Chair, one of the things um, that we're looking at doing um, as an outcome of some of the work that we're doing in Brantford is uh, estimating a uh, number of structures, uh, estimated costs with and without the dikes and with and without reservoirs, basically organizing information that we can report on that um, because um, often mitigation works are implemented, dams or dikes, they do their job, but folks may forget the value that they're bringing. So being able to analyze and try to report on the number of structures that uh, flooding was avoided in or an estimate of, of the damage reduction, I think um, is certainly important. And I know uh, the mayor of Brantford previously commented just um, uh, averting trauma to citizens is very important. And often we don't think of that, but um, you know, it's very disruptive, very traumatizing to citizens if they get flooded. So some of these works actually help avoid that. Thank you, Richard. Joe? Yeah, uh, Dwight, it was uh, uh, a rather scary situation at the Wellesley Dam. Um, I, I did try uh, on a few times trying to, you know, um, advise the GRCA as to the situation. I think we were within about two or three inches of, of breaching the sides um, before the uh, the uh, crew finally came. I found it difficult to um, uh, connect with people. So you have that guide that you just mentioned a, a few minutes ago. Uh, is and I I must have missed it. But is that guide? Can you mail out that guide to our staff? myself uh, is, it a, is it a hard copy it's it's a hard copy but we can also direct it to the uh, an electronic copy um it is provided or mailed out to municipalities and board members so you should have a copy if you don't certainly let me know and we'll, we'll yeah. make sure you get it and uh, it's it's got the contact information for not only ourselves but also your emergency management staff um and it it's helpful even to municipal staff, because if they want to talk to a counterpart in another municipality, all that information is organized in that guide. So, you know, I know they've found it useful that it just connects people and, you know, our, our cell phone numbers are there and that sort of thing. And cell phone is likely the best way to connect with us after hours. 
Yeah. One thing we did look at text messaging and a thing I want to highlight about text messaging. Uh, when we looked at it, we avoided using text messaging because the telecom companies will not guarantee that a text message is delivered or delivered in a timely manner. If their systems get overloaded, they may just drop some text messages off and they're never delivered. Um, or they may get delivered well after the fact. So that's why the most direct communication is uh, really picking up the phone um, because uh, you know we're, we're busy during an event and uh, we're, we're gonna be uh, responding to phone calls, but uh, that, that's the most direct way of contacting us during an event. And also I'd encourage you to work through your emergency management folks um, just to keep everybody in the loop. Usually what we try to do is uh, deal with the municipal emergency management folks um, and, you know, they're, they're quite comfortable giving us a phone call any hour of the day. And, uh, you know, we work collectively to try to, uh, to manage floods. Well, okay. I, I'd appreciate it if you could send myself a copy of that. I don't have one. I'd, I'd like to have one on my desk. These things seem sure. to be happening uh, a little bit more often now. Um, yep. Agreed. And the, when it comes to, uh, I think you mentioned, uh, you know, working with somebody in the community to help, uh, regulate that dam, uh, you know, once again, maybe that would be the fire department that we we could have a discussion with uh, when the time is right. So, sure, appreciate that. And I'd be happy to uh, facilitate that if uh, if need be. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Joe. Sue, um, maybe we need to do a refresher on this because we had this set up several years ago, Dwight, and you set it up. So, for example, North Dumfries. Um, the messages come through to G from GRCA. Uh, they go to Robert Schantz, our fire chief, and our chief administrative officer, uh, Andrew McNeely. He gives it to our communication staff who Facebook and tweet it out instantly. And uh -huh. they are updated periodically throughout the day on what's happening, what GRCA is doing. And everything is already coordinated through that team. It runs really smooth. Uh, my community is always up to date and knows what's going on. This was implemented by Dwight about four or five years ago, Dwight, if I'm correct. And maybe we need a refresher on that, Dwight, on how that system works, because it's smooth. All the contact names are there, everything. Robert has some. Robert is the force, uh, the main contact. CEO McNeely is the follow-up, and he's monitoring the whole thing for council. So council gets an update. Through these events, we get an hourly update. On our so you, you need to maybe re refresh this for us, Dwight, uh, maybe in a future GRCA meeting and, and get it implemented in all these uh, municipalities because it works smoother than design. My people are so happy. They give an hourly updates. My uh, council's constantly updated and it's very methodical, very well organized. And it came from you originally, Dwight. So if we could have a refresher maybe on that. Through you, Mr. Chair, certainly we, we could bring that back. Uh, it might have been myself partially involved, but certainly our communication staff work closely with, with township staff. And, uh, um, you know, it's constantly evolving. I think the one challenge we have with communications um, and why I try to really lock in the means of emergency communications during events is there's just a myriad of ways we can communicate these days. But when we're in an emergency, there's only certain what I call communications channels that we can monitor very closely. And having good communications to keep um, both the municipal councils informed uh, just puts uh, municipal councillors in a better position to respond to residents' questions. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, feedback is welcome. If things aren't working, that's how we learn and we can improve over time. So we do appreciate feedback. Yeah. And Dwight, just to, re to reiterate, so you send out those blasts to all the municipalities anyways, telling us, updating us, you know, level one, level two, and the job of communication. So we have a system. It goes to Robert. Robert sends it to my CAO and to my communications person. Communication person gets it out, and the CAO is responsible for informing council and keeping them updated. So you create yep. this level, it's very smooth, it runs really well, and it doesn't affect GRCA more staff. They just do the initial contacts and the updates to one person, That's and that one person funnels it through our system, and everybody's updated. It works really well. Yep. All right. Thank you, Sue. Any uh, further comments or questions on this item? Uh, Joan? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, through you to Dwight. Dwight, um, a number of months ago, you mentioned that the um, precipitation measuring gauge in Brantford was out of service, but you used the Burford gauge. Has that one been repaired in Brantford? I, I'm just wondering, because we had, it was an extraordinary event and I measured it here where I live and we had 97 millimeters through the course of that event. And I think it was the most rain I'd seen since the tornado came through Waterford a number of years ago. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, um, you likely were referring to the Paris rain gauge. There was an issue with the Paris rain gauge during the recent event, but we operate a network of rain gauges and we wouldn't look at a, a specific rain gauge um, to try to have redundancy, we just have many rain gauges so that, that way if one's not um, operating correctly, uh, we have the information from the other rain gauges uh, to rely on. And we also have the weather radar uh, information that we also uh, rely on to have a look at where the, uh, the, the extent of, of the rainfall. So, you know, we don't put all the rigs in one basket, I, I guess that's the easiest way to, uh, to respond to that. And to my knowledge, yes, our, our maintenance staff have visited uh, the Paris Rain Gauge and uh, addressed the issue. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing further, I have a motion that report number GM 102174, September 22, 23, 2021 flood event be received as information. Moved by Joe, second by Kathy. Any opposed? Catherine, did you have a question? Okay, any opposed? That is carried, thank you. And continuing on with uh, Dwight, if he wants to give us anything for the current watershed conditions. Uh, the only thing I would highlight, uh, I'll take any questions on the watershed conditions report. We are planning our um, fall uh, flood coordinators meeting December 2nd. Um, we started to have two flood coordinators meetings a year now. Uh, we started it last year. We see weather events in that uh, holiday period or January, February. So we feel it's important to make sure we have all our contact information up to date. There's a lot of change going on now with retirements in uh, municipalities. Um, so, you know, we're constantly bringing new people into the program. So we have that, uh, that date set for December 2nd. And we have a, a special speaker uh, or guest speaker for that uh, date. Um, there's a speaker from um, emergency response out of uh, the state of Michigan that dealt with some of the dam break flooding uh, in May 2020. And uh, the success story out of Michigan was their emergency plans. They were able to get people out of the way. There was no deaths or fatalities uh, during that dam break event down in, in Michigan. So uh, we look forward to that presentation from the guest speaker to uh, to communicate uh, you know, the success of their emergency plan um, in that uh, county. Okay, Dwight, thank you. Are there any comments or questions for Dwight? I have a motion that report number GM 102176, current watershed conditions as of October 13, 2021 be received as information. Moved by Marcus, seconded by Bruce Banbury. Any opposed? That is carried. Uh, move right along to other business. It's the Warren Show. Go ahead, sir. Floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of shout outs this morning that I want to, to give um, to our communities. Rocky, Rocker, excuse me, Rogers Hockey Town Home, Hometown Hockey made a visit to the North Don't Freeze Community Center in air on the weekend of no October 16th and 17th. The community was decorated with red, white, and black colors of the Air Centennials who compete in the Greater Ontario Junior Hockey League. On Monday, the October the 28th, uh, Ron McLean and Tara Sloan hosted a program on Rogers TV prior to the NHL um, New York Rangers and Toronto Hockey uh, Maple Leafs hockey game. Congratulations to Mayor Foxton and the residents of North Dumfries for celebrating their long hockey history. 
On the same date uh, on the weekend uh, in Woolwich Township in Elmira, they celebrated the 50th reunion of the Sugar Kings uh, hockey team. And the reunion took place at the Woolwich Community Center. Um, a lot of good things happening in our communities in hockey and now the, the air is full of hockey, I think, as long as we've got this cold weather coming. And also something to mark down in your calendars, you haven't been out to Westmont Rose in the, the past or coming up, you should maybe plan to go on November the 15th, 2021. That will mark the 140th opening of the uh, Westmont Rose Covered Bridge, the last remaining covered bridge in the province of Ontario. But the bridge will close in the new year for major renovation. So if you want to see it now as it is, go this fall. If not, wait until it's open again in 2022. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Warren. I should point out if Rockwood had a hockey team, we'd probably win all that stuff, just so you know. <laughs> Um, is there anything further for other business? Congratulations, Sue. So we're going to move into a closed meeting now. I have a motion that the general membership enter a closed meeting to discuss a confidential matter. Move. If we could just wait a moment to confirm when the live stream starts again. Okay, we're good. Good to go. All right. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we have nothing to report out except um, the minutes you, minutes from the... Sorry. sorry. Uh, Jerry has his hand raised. Sorry. I'm sorry. You know what? The live stream little box is right in front of his, his hand. It's blocking it. Go ahead, Jerry. Sorry. Just in, as a note for the closed session minutes. Um, uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh. We're, back, we're back and open now. R right. Um, perhaps I'll send a note to uh, the staff. That would do. Great. Is thanks. that all right? Yeah. They pop a note to uh, Karen or, or, or Sam. All right. Thanks, Jerry. So uh, I have a motion that the minutes of the previous closed session be received as information. Moved by John, seconded by Sue. Any opposed? That is carried. And one either item, other business uh, guy? Yeah, I'll just so I apologize for bringing that that up at the uh, wrong time. I kind of was uh, thinking of that since it was staff, we might be talking about staffing levels and stuff that it might be something that was dealt and closed, but I was incorrect and thanks for correcting me. I just wondering about once again, the uh, the workload, the recruitment of new staff members and just how the uh, conservation authority is dealing with this new reality, especially around the planning and building um, with their with with everyone being so busy, it's it's hard. Uh, um, we're finding that organizations, both private and public, are finding a hard time retaining and recruiting staff members. Just wondering about an update, please. All right, thank you. And you're, you're you're right, guy. I mean, typically that would be enclosed, but I think that's when you've got a specific identifiable person, and we may want to. Anyway, go ahead, Karen or Sam. Yeah, I was just going to see if Nancy is on. The call, no. Okay. Um, yeah, so staff, uh, they've certainly seen a, an increase in permits and applets, uh, circulations from the municipalities regarding um, planning. We did create two new positions um, in the planning department that have been filled to help with the increased workload. Um, I think it's probably not a surprise either that the specific skill set that's um, that planners and plan review staff have are in high demand right now. Um, so we currently also have had um, some transition in our department with leaves as well in terms of uh, staff going on leave. Um, so right now we are in the process of hiring a contract position to help um, backfill. A leave. Um, so we, we still uh, are in the process of hiring, but I think, Guy, you've kind of identified to some of the challenges is just the people who have those skills are in really high demand right now. Um, I think it's not only conservation authorities, municipalities, particularly in the 
planning and development realm, there's been such an increase that um, uh, it's hard to attract uh, qualified staff or to get qualified staff um, right now in that industry just because of the boom that they're having. But uh, Nancy and her team are certainly looking at ways in which they can adapt to the demands. So looking at different ways in which they can um, process the workflow um, and manage the increase um, with the additional staff that they do have, but also looking at ways in which they can better manage um, the, the volume that's coming in to the office. Does that kind of cover it, Guy? Or? I, I, absolutely. That, that, that's just all, all I was looking for for now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. All right, if there is nothing further, can I get a motion that the meeting of the general membership be adjourned? Moved by Marcus, seconded by Bruce Whale. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, next meeting on the 26th of November. We'll see you then. Have a happy Halloween. I know <laughs> Warren will be out trick-or-treating.